In the next few minutes, I hope to convince you that this book is the correct choice for Trent Bonus 2010. I believe that Good Tool Fall should serve as our selection for a number of reasons. Like Professor Steffler, I think that Good Tool Fall is a novel that Trent community should read together because it comments on connecting with others and building new families. By entering into university life, we enter into a new community and also a new family. Trent professors, fellow students, and other university staff will all influence us and the way we live our lives because we are all members of the same community. According to Trent website, one of the school's goals is to develop graduates who are, ready to, who are ready to make a difference in the world, and that starts by making connections with others. In one poor decision, Clara Purdy, the book's main character, is awoken from her complacent life with a bang, literally, as she crashes into an oncoming vehicle, crushing another family's car, home, and hope for the future. Feeling at fault for their situation and a complicated need to do right, Clara Purdy opens her heart, home, and wallet to the Gage family who in return change the way she thinks, acts, and lives. Now I'm not saying that the decision we make in university will be as immediately drastic as taking a strange family into our homes and spending our life savings on them. <laughs> but like Clara, you Clara, uh, we as members of the Trent community will make choices that will affect us and others now and in the future. One unexpected and still delightful element of Good Tool Fall is Endicott's use of humor. If laughter really is the best medicine, the readers of this book will get just enough. Through bizarre characters and comedic descriptions, the readers afforded a break from the serious questions posed by the book. Whether it was a shoplifting grandmother secretly soothing a child with Ben, ben Owen, or Clara Purdy calling a bad-tempered neighbor badly bent instead of badly bunt, we find relief and release in these lighter moments. And the ability to use humor is just one stylistic element to praise in this book. Her ability to seamlessly change narrators enriches and complicates good to a fault, which should be praised for its technique, style, tone, and its content. Last, I believe that Endicott has provided us with a book that provokes thought and raises great questions. Like what makes someone good, and where is the line between being good and being good to a fault? One element present in Good to a Fault that is sure to resonate with many of the Trent community is its heart-wrenching portrayal of cancer, the far-reaching effects of the disease, and its victims and its survivors. Through her portrayal of cancer, Endicott shows the randomness of the disease, of the disease and tragedy in general. One of the criteria for choosing a book for Trent Reese is its ability to generate lively discussions, something good to a fall will do. Endicott's work contains themes relevant to many members of Trent University, including struggling with class and faith, and the coming together of the community to help someone in need, much like Trent has done by raising money for those in Haiti and Afghanistan, and on an even more local level, but by donating to women's shelters and participating in pen pal programs. Clara, like many of us, wants to do something good in the world by helping others but struggles to find her place. By taking in this family, Clara has created a situation where she is needed, where she can do some good and really connect with others. Clara may not get what she wants when she finally becomes an active citizen in the world, participating and actually living her life, but in the end, she does get what she needs, which is something we should all hope to receive. Thank you. I have three passages that I'm going to read uh, from the book, uh, scattered throughout the book. And just to put one more thing into context, you heard how Clara, who's the main character, has taken in this family. But just to help understand these passages, one piece of information that's on the back of the book, so I'm not giving anything away, is that the mother is in the hospital quite sick with cancer. And so the children and the mother-in-law are with Clara, uh, but uh, not the mother. And the father left. So this is the very first two chapters of the book. Thinking about herself and the state of her soul, Clara Purdy drove to the bank one hot Friday in July. The other car came from nowhere, speeding through on the yellow, going so fast it was almost safely past when Clara's car caught it. She was pushing on the brake, a ballet move, graceful, pulling back on the wheel with both arms as she rose, her foot standing on the brake, and then terrible crash, a painful extended rending sound when the metals met. The sound kept on longer than you'd expect, Clara thought, having time to think as the car scraped sides and changed each other's direction as the metal ripped open and bent and assumed new shapes. They stopped. The motion stopped. Then the people from the other car came spilling out. The doors opened, and like milk boiling over on the stove, bursting to the boil, they all frothed out onto the pavement. It seemed they came out the windows, but it was only the doors. And this is from later on, obviously, chapter 10. Clara went to their room, 
opened the window and left the curtains open, plumped up their pillows and added a fleece blanket over Trevor's duvet. Then she put them back to bed. She sat in the semi cave of the lower bunk, smoothing Dolly's shin. Pierce lay curled up on her lap, happy to be held. Betty Pringle, she had a pig. Clara sang for Trevor, and he chimed in softly, almost with a tune. As on my way to Strawberry Fair, she sang. Baby's boat is silver noon, sailing in the sky. She felt Dolly going limp as she patted her and heard her breathing change. She stopped singing. That was wonderful, Trevor said from above her. Clara sat on in the little cave, wondering if she would be able to recall this later, when she was an old woman alone in some nursing home, if she would remember Trevor saying, wonderful, and the sleeping weight of Pierce on her lap, and Dolly under her hand, and how she'd done that herself, put them at ease, even though they were not her own. This is from a chapter called Downhill. There was a girl in grade three whose mother was dead. People's mothers die. Dolly could not even stand to look at her. In assembly, when they talked about car accidents or crossing safety, everybody would stare at her because her mother had been killed by a drunk driver. And then the girl, whose name was Janine, but Dolly did not want to know it, did not want to see her face, would stare back at everybody, her eye twitching, which made Dolly want to throw up. She crossed the hall to avoid Janine, held back in line, never to be next to her, as if she might catch it. That was stupid, but she could not stand near her. Janine's mother was dead, already dead. Dolly put her head down and read. She stuck her book inside her language arts book, and she whipped through her math so she could read the book under the desk and the textbook on top. She read Mistress Masham's Repose as hard as she could. She did not mind reading about Maria, whose mother was dead too, because it was in a book and it was away from here. And it was pretend. <laughs>